Greetings, I'm Judy Innes, the subject of this intellectual biography. I want to start by thanking Leonard Mackler and Dan, Dan Milt for the terrific job they did on this. They worked so hard, they read widely across my writings, they grappled with the ideas, they interviewed colleagues who understand the work, but also, and most importantly, they brought their own perspective as junior scholars uh, to this work, so hopefully it will reach out to you younger scholars out there. Um, this is an insightful, as, as a result, it's an un insightful and accurate analysis of my most important intellectual projects. And because they write extremely well, uh, they managed to actually explain some of my ideas better than I did in the first place. They also managed to find connections across different aspects of my work or over time that I had actually not noticed in the first place. Overall, this is an impressive effort and I think you will find the pamphlet easy to read and understand. Now let me say something about my writing style. Since Dan and Leonard <coughs> made a point of commenting on the clarity of my writing. Now, it took me a long time to get to be a clear and persuasive writer. It was a lot of work over a lot of years. So I want to tell you what five major steps I took uh, in the course of my career that have allowed me at this point to be, I would immodestly say, a good writer. Maybe some of these will help some of you in developing more persuasive and powerful writing styles. Let me start with the first step. That was in high school, when I was in English class, and I had to write a really long essay. And I normally did very well in writing, but the teacher told me that she would not accept this long essay until I revised it completely. I was really upset. I figured she was known for being mean and this wasn't fair. But then I decided to go ahead and, and revise it. And so what I learned then was to always put a topic sentence at the beginning of every paragraph and to make sure that every single word in that paragraph was related to that topic sentence. The second thing I learned to do was to make transitions between paragraphs so that they would be flowing together, not abruptly changing or confusingly changing. Uh, the second, the, the third lesson, let's see, the second lesson was uh, when I went to college at Harvard, I majored in English literature, and I loved stories and novels, so that's why I did it. But I also learned a lot about the structure of narrative and how stories can convey things that can't be conveyed in more technical writing or that can't be conveyed in uh, statistics. They go beyond those things and touch people in ways that that other kind of writing never does. So I thought this was a great new learning experience for my future writing. But then when I started writing my dissertation at MIT, my then husband, Richard Denefield, a civil engineering professor there, uh, told me I could not write my dissertation like a story. It wasn't supposed to have a surprise ending. He told me it had to start with a conclusion so that people would be able to follow the whole dissertation as they went through it. I needed to know it at the beginning. Well, I really resisted this idea, but in the end I took his advice and I wrote a topic paragraph for my dissertation, or a topic pages, two pages. Uh, that was more like a topic sentence and a paragraph, but it was a paragraph for a whole paper. That actually helped guide me through the writing as well. But it was kind of strange putting the conclusion at the beginning, and so now I don't bother to write the beginning 
until I finish the whole paper, then I go back and put in the introduction. The next thing I did was to was when I was later at Berkeley, I this was actually the most important thing that I did. Uh, I assembled a group of uh, female colleagues from different departments for a writing workshop. We proposed to use the methodology of our writing teacher, Louise Dunlap, who's written a book on this methodology. Uh, and we basically, every week, we would, one of us would bring in three pages or so of writing. And then we would read it aloud to the rest of the group. Then we would start around the group, and each person in the group would tell what they thought I had said, or the writer had said. And then, when this happened to me, I was really upset, annoyed at first, when the first person clearly didn't understand what I'd said. They weren't listening, I'm sure, and they were not very smart, whatever. Uh, but then when the second person didn't understand it, I thought, well, maybe there I should think about this. By the time the fourth person clearly didn't get the point, I had to face it. It was me, not them. And I had to start revising my writing. Uh, so we began in that process to learn to write for the reader. And the way we learned that was also uh, that we would read it, the, the paper aloud again and everybody would tell us what they were thinking about while we were getting to certain parts of the paper. And what I discovered was that when I got to the most important conceptual part of the article, they would say, well, I was thinking about what's for dinner. And that was very disturbing because I wanted them to understand that. Uh, when that happened to all of us, we began to realize we needed to add things to our writing, like metaphors, images, examples, other kinds of ways of helping people pay attention and get an image of what we were trying to say, as well as just listening to dull, boring words. Uh, so now we all write with the reader in mind, rather than just our own writer in mind. So, to this day, I still think about, what would Kathy say to this? Would Kathy understand this? Uh, and that has really helped me a lot. Finally, the last thing I did was after I got tenure, because you know, you're supposed to write things by yourself before tenure, I, uh, I uh, began to look for collaborators, people that I could work with who I could do research with, I could write with, and this was extremely productive and helpful. We would argue over the evidence, argue over the arguments, we would have dialogues around uh, the wording and around what we meant by certain concepts, and we would sharpen our thinking and we would develop theory while we were doing this, but finally we would just have a much better, stronger paper together. That, uh, in particular, I want to say, I want to say how much I owe to Judith Gruber, the late Judith Gruber, with whom I worked for 20 years, a political scientist who always insisted on rigor, which, as a planner, I was a little fuzzy about rigor. Then, the other person to whom I owe a lot is David Bohr, my partner and collaborator, who's always pushed me beyond my comfort zone intellectually. And that's been a very important feature of my learning to think and write better. Finally, <clears throat> changing the subject, the uh, editors have asked me to talk about a book that has made a difference to, in my career and in, in my thinking. And the one that comes to mind that has been most important to me is a book by Abraham Kaplan called The Conduct of Inquiry. It's pretty much an epistemology book, but it's well written and it helped me to learn how to design research 
at a time when there was there were no handbooks. I was doing interpretive methodology, qualitative methodology, which was not acceptable in those days. In general, my my faculty, my professors didn't understand that, so I needed this to help me with assure that I had the legitimacy in the academic world for what I was doing. Um, and I found this an extremely powerful and useful book uh, in the period when it was definitely not done to do qualitative research, except in anthropology or something. Well, with that, let's turn to Dan and Leonard's booklet. Thank you.